Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, you will hear a discussion with writer-director Richard Linklater and stars Tyler Hoechlin, Blake Jenner, Glenn Powell, and Wyatt Russell from the film Everybody Wants Some, moderated by Access Hollywood's Scott Mance, recorded at the Landmark West L.A. Hello. It all started... Actually, back in 1993 with a movie called Dazed and Confused. Who loves that film? Started there, yeah. True. So, <laughs> we never talked about that movie much, did we? Did we ever? I, I honestly now? never heard the words uttered. I was wondering. Yeah, someone asked. I said, we never, it was kind of there. You know, I was open about this being when the did you spiritual guys actually sequel. See it? Yeah, when did you guys actually see Dazed and Confused? Uh, years ago, yeah. I, it, it wasn't exactly a prerequisite to be in this movie. We never, like I said, we never talked about it, but it didn't matter. Well, at what point did you say, you know what? I think the time has come to do a, a spiritual sequel to Dazed and Confused. I think I made up that term, by the way. Uh, it, but it caught I, on. I've started, I've started a genre. You did. <laughs> I'm interested in whatever the next spirit, because people are like, what the hell is a spiritual sequel? Well, actually, that's a good question. And it question. was a thing. I just used it to kind of... Um, help maybe get the movie made, you know, and I was saying, eh, it's kind of, you know, if you like that movie, it'll be kind of like that. So <laughs> even though it doesn't have the same characters, I was just explaining that was my high school, this is my college, it's sort of a spiritual sequel. I never thought I'd see those words on a poster <laughs> or on a, <laughs> in an ad, but I think they found out that that was kind of a, it, well, it's true, but it's, you know, it was just kind of hard to explain. But. Well, at what point, guys, you know, you auditioned for this film, but not for the characters you played. How did that whole process work, and how did you decide, okay, you're going to play this person, this person, and so on? Well, the first thing, we just had a discussion, and we didn't really talk about, I don't know if we talked about specific characters. We just kind of, I was wanting to get to know you guys. So. Yeah, um, what, through the audition process? Yeah. Well, I think for all of us, we all started just going in with uh, the amazing casting directors behind the film. We we kind of went in and like started talking about ourselves and kind of you know what we're into and all that jazz. Came yeah. back, did some scenes. Came I'm back. looking at those on you yeah. know on my laptop. By the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, we had to put uh, baseball baseball stuff on uh, on uh, on tape for Rick and mine was. I hope that never sees the light of day. Because it was terrible. Oh, it's going to be on the DVD. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, after that, we just started, uh, I think we were told to pick, like, a few characters, then zero in, pick two, like, you know, three, then two, then kind of the one that we related to the most. Then yeah, these kind of sprawling ensembles. You don't, I'm just trying to get the best actors I can, you know. And then, you know, there's an old, um, like, a general manager of a football team there was one famous one who said, I just, I just draft the best athletes. Then I'll figure out what position they're going to play. I just want the best guys. And I kind of felt the same way here. It's a sports movie, so I can say an analogy like that. But it was kind of like, yeah, I just wanted the best, most unique comic sensibilities. And also it was a little narrow because they had to kind of be athletes. You know, they had to have athletic build. be you know, So it narrowed it down a little bit. A lot of people just didn't. Those, the funny um, DVD extra would be the skills tapes of all the guys who didn't qualify <laughs> to get here. Because everybody said, yeah, I'm a good baseball player. I'm like, oh, really? And I was like, well, I want everyone to send in. Just, it's so easy. Just put a little camera on yourself. Just throw in, hitting little things like that. And it's like, ooh, you know. That's dropped right, that's off, dropped off pretty fast. <laughs> Tyler didn't send one. He just sent some ESPN footage from, <laughs> from the regional you know, semifinals or something so when he played. So that was impressive. <laughs> well, in, t in terms of workshopping and, and, you know, capturing the chemistry, because, I mean, you really, like, bought this. I mean, you really, like, well, these guys really are good friends. And you spent how many, how much time did you spend living together on his ranch? <laughs> was it three weeks on and off? Three weeks? About, yeah, three, yeah, three we, weeks. We spent three uh, weeks before we started shooting. You guys all came to where I live. Yeah. His his daughter wrote a, a beautiful poem that she performed oh, for us right. at, at South oh, by yeah. called called Twelve Hunks and Bunks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a very cute yeah. performance. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was like the world's greatest experience. We went and and all hung out at at the farm for three weeks and did a writer's room and, and it was truly, truly, truly incredible. First thing Everybody. we did was play a, a football game. 
Oh yeah, yeah that's right. right. That was the first. I was all-time Ryan quarterback. Rashid. Yeah, Ryan Ryan oh, Guzman like acted like he tore his ACL. Oh, that was oh yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they passed it around and we ran in for figured. a touchdown. That's when Rick and I started having some beef. I was like, this guy's <laughs> willing to play dirty. Yeah, he's yeah. my kind of he's guy. A, yeah. Low, yeah, he he fits on the team. Rick was all-time quarterback. Anything to win. <laughs> yeah, but you learn a lot about people <laughs> like that. Well, what did you learn about these guys where you just said, okay, this is this is great for your character, this is great for your character. I mean, was there anything, any sort of magical moments that came out through that workshopping that you didn't actually have scripted that wound up being on the big so screen? So much. I mean, yeah. so much really came out of that. I would say particularly, I would say the underwritten parts, you know, you have a big, you know, it's just words on a page and a character's name, but I don't, you know, I'm not too beholden to that. I, I'm trying to match the the character and and get them. You know, I have these ideas about what they are, but I'm really interested in who they are mm -hmm. and what they bring to it. And you just through this multi-week process, you know, someone would say something funny, or they I could just see them dialing in on their character. You know, uh, Tanner, the guy who played Brumley. I mean, I think he has a few lines in the script. I was just I needed real ball players to kind of fill out the team. And I didn't exactly know where that was going. He's written as kind of a tough guy. He's a freshman, but he kind of, he wins the knuckle Ranch flipping out. thing, flicking <laughs> thing, but he kind of holds his own. I kind of thought he was maybe a tougher freshman guy. <laughs> that was obviously and not the way. He did not end up that way. Because like, and he was funny. He'd done a lot of, um, he was a film student, done a lot of comedy, improv. You know, I just liked his energy and he was funny. He had some very funny auditions when he kept coming back in. I just liked the guy. And uh, I didn't know where it was going to go. And he just started doing this thing pretty he early making on. making fun of him so much in rehearsal yeah. that it, yeah. It yeah, it just, just, he went with it, though. Yeah. It was yeah. like the joke was on him. Yeah. I'm the dork. I'm the, I was like, yeah, that's good for the team. All these, you know, testosterone macho guys. Like, there's one total beta guy who's like, hey, guys. I'm the, you know, I was like, <laughs> but that works. You know, you get a differentiation. The worst thing was, like, you don't remember the guys. They're all kind of the same. Because it can read like that. Right. It can read like that. And so... In this case, it, it was like, yeah, I'm looking for these specifics, you know. Um, Austin with his bad betting thing. That just kind of <laughs> came up. And that was true. I mean, we're on the team. This is very personal to me. I, I lived in this house. And, you know, we had these two houses, and there were 18 guys <laughs> living in two houses. And there's always one guy that the bookies are kind of trying to track down. <laughs> you know, all that competitiveness also bleeds into, like, betting a lot <laughs> and gambling. and. <laughs> Losing money and yeah, so I thought, oh, that's perfect. The guy, the guy who's the really crappy, better. I remember like triple one, or nothing. One specific thing with like with the dumbest uh, bet ever. with Austin was that like some of us talking to him, we're like, no, dude, like you're the lefty pitcher because he, I think he did something. He's like, is this too weird? And like, you're the lefty pitcher. You can be as you, weird yeah, as you, you want. That's your and he's job. Like, okay, to cool, be the cool. And he just ran with it. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> well, why so do you think that the uh, the movie, even though it takes place in 1980? And it's very specific to a particular time. It's it's really a, a film that people, everyone's going to get. It doesn't matter when it takes place. I mean, what what do you think, Len, about the timelessness of the movie, even though it is dated? Blake's got Blake's something great to say, say about this. You got the best answer for this. <laughs> 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 well, what I always say is, uh, you know, like the you know all the external things change like the, the the haircuts change and the the music changes and the clothes change but you know growing up and finding who you are within a group of people or just in the world and and you know trying to decipher the the bs from the real in any situation i mean that that never really changes ever so that's a great answer yeah. it is true oh, it's a great answer yeah that's the core but Pass things the buck for a reason things do really change like we had dance lessons i had to like these guys, people don't really dance the way they did, you know, back then. You don't go, do you guys do this? You go ask the girl who you kind of have a crush on, hey, you want to dance? And then you go out on the dance floor, and then if that goes well, maybe you keep dancing. And, you know, it's like this extended foreplay thing. I don't know. How does it work now? What do you guys think? It doesn't think? look like that. Yeah, you just It's all, you just it's all kinda, Twitter. It's all just Facebook. Twitter and like, you know, but that was kind of the methodology of the day. It's all Facebook poking it was, now. It's all Facebook. It <laughs> you just poke and you're, you're in. You're but, in like Flynn. Yeah, you know. So I kind of started appreciating the differences. I kind of had these specifics were, uh, and it made me think, like, I saw how much fun you guys were having, like, disco dance lessons with, maybe that was because a lot of ladies showed up for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was it. But, um. We had the room full of, <laughs> but um, I saw how much fun they were having. I said, it made me think like, oh, that was a good time to be in, to be in college. I, I, I won some kind of, you know, genetic lottery or, you know, being born at that time. It was, it was, made me think that was a fun time. 
Well, it was a fun time, especially for people yeah. like you and me who, who videotaped our favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone. Yeah. Of and I, I was I've taped all the episodes of Star Trek and now I got them all in Blu-ray. So what's the point? <laughs> but why? Yeah. I mean, like you became like a Twilight Zone, you know, aficionado here after making the movie. Yeah, we were talking about it in the car, and there's a few that now I'm gonna have to go home and watch tonight because I haven't I haven't seen them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's but quite I did few. watch that episode with Donald Donald. What was it? Uh, Donna Dean? Donna Douglas. Donna Douglas. Ellie Mae Clampett. Um, and <laughs> yeah. Eye of the Beholder. And, uh, season two, to episode four. <laughs> whatever you say, episode season two, four. episode five, um, and 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 then there's a few other ones. The one, the other one was is the uh, the I, think, I guess it was the pilot episode. Of yeah. The, where is everybody? Were, where is everybody? Where the 1959. guys around and They hold up. You guys. Well, they're uh, shot on film. There was one year they were shot on video. It looks kind of bad. Second season. Second. Yeah, that was a yeah. mistake. But <laughs> other than that, they were shot. You know, 35 millimeter old TV. I was showing my daughters like Green Acres. You know, and they're beautiful. They're amazing. They're they look great. beautiful colors, and you know, just TV from the '80s looks terrible. Now he was named Willoughby after a stop at Willoughby, right? That's a tough one. Uh, Willoughby has a lot of inputs. I don't. <laughs> there was a there was a basketball player named Willoughby. There's a lot of Willoughbys in the world. Good coincidence. So I can't, can't really say it's not a one-on-one. -on -one. But like you know, while after the workshop you're making the film, how did you guys all push each other to do your best? You know, how did you like motivate each other, or was it just out of the friendship that you made, workshopping and living together? Um, I think it was just that everybody kind of saw what everybody else was doing, uh, and everyone kind of sat and you're sitting in a room, and everyone has like their moments and their scenes. And you're like, God, that's really good. That's really, really good and really funny. And it just kind of made you want to rise to that level. It's kind of it's a team environment, so it it's like being team. on a sports team. You don't you don't want to be the weakest link. You want to make it as strong as possible. So everyone just kind of pushed everyone and not in a way of like wanting to top anyone yeah, like there was never any, none, none of that it was the most selfless group of people i've ever worked with it was yeah. awesome yeah, it was beautifully um, like it, it's not at all competitive even they're they're portraying guys who were uber like ridiculously competitive that was so not it we were there trying to make the best film we can and it was such a wonderful experience because these guys were so generous with each other they were so like just there you know kind of accepting their role and trying to help. The, it was just kind of a wonderful, it was kind of my best ensemble experience. But if I had to compare it to Dazed, Days is, it's high school, you know, there are these yeah. factions. Oh, so-and-so doesn't like so-and-so. And that's kind of how it felt on the movie. Oh, this group of girls ganged up on, the, you know, I was, sometimes I'd be doing a scene with, with the guys and I'd say, I know you guys kind of hate each other, but I need you to act like your best friends in this scene. Sure. That kind of happened a little bit. So I was a little aware of that and I was like, I want a, a team dynamic, and a lot of it's my fault. You know, casting someone I think is a little weird, but I think they'll be good. This one, I really, I've learned something over the years. I said, you know, I want the, the two people in the movie who are playing the kind of out guys, yeah. Will Britton as Buter, Justin Street as Niles, are the two guys, the two weirdos, the obligatory weirdos on the team. But they, they were so not those guys. No, you know, they came no. in, they were like really great guys, good actors, and such team players that, that I said, I even told like Justin, I said, you need to play this guy, so you need to do character work, but it's gonna motivate everybody if they actually like you and they see you doing that. If you'll go out there and play that guy, it'll, it'll be a good team dynamic. And it, it, it's better to do that than to actually hire the weird guy that <laughs> no one likes, because <laughs> right. he has to live with you. you know, and then it just kind of comes like, eh. Well, one you know, of the so things I've that I've learned like, a little bit over the years. Was so cool, was such a cool thing to be able to experience was like just, first of all, Rick's uh, his full confidence in, in, in us as, as people. Um, but also that when we were looking for what the story was going to be, that the story was about the team. And so everybody got that. Everybody totally understood that like indiv the individual is not greater than the team here. And whatever I can do to service the story is going to service the team. And that's what the movie's about, and and uh, or you know what what our story of the team is about. And so everybody, when they came up with an idea, the idea was serviced towards the complete making of the team. It wasn't serviced for just your character, and that was a really. I mean, I probably it's probably uber rare in acting because everybody is inherently selfish human being. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was fun to make a movie about a team. So, you know, it was so much about that. You know? And, you know, baseball featured in Days and Confused. You directed a, a remake bit, yeah. of Bad News Bears. You're, you're mm -hmm. a fan. You're a baseball fan. 
Yeah, like I said, this, this didn't come out of nowhere. You know, I did show up at college on a baseball scholarship. You know, this really, so much of this really happened. You know, so it was, it's amazing how much something can mean in your life from age 12 to 20 and then just be, mean nothing to your life. <laughs> but you can kind of recycle it in your mind and make a movie about it years later. So. <laughs> That's well, baseball. For, for, for Glenn and Tyler, I mean, you guys uh, sort of went the extra mile with uh, the mustaches. <laughs> You know. I mean, Tom Selleck here, I mean, you definitely went the extra mile. You that's did a, look like Tom dirty, Selleck. Well, no, we, it's it's either Tom Selleck or Super Mario. Bert, Bert, Bert we call him Burke McReynolds. <laughs> yeah, he Bert was Mick Reynolds. We were calling him Bert, Bert McReynolds. Mick Reynolds. Was the name of the mustache. Yeah, his name was Bert. How much did, did you keep him for a while after you were done? Or like, you oh, know, yeah. shave him right oh, away? Yeah. Like, I'm t- well, we finished right before Thanksgiving. And so we were going into December. And December, you actually get to kind of do what you want sometimes because there's not a lot going on. So, yeah, I kept it through the holidays for sure. Oh, yeah. and, and Glenn, I think you cut your mustache. You broke the record. Like we wrapped. You know, it used to be <laughs> when you shot on film, it would be you'd have to get a negative report, and that usually came the next day. So the actors would have to hang on to their hair and mustaches, things like that. Too, you got a negative report. What if there was a hair in the gate? What if we have to reshoot? Hang on to that mustache for, until we tell you everything's fine. Well, this, you know, it was like we wrapped, and then I saw you about. Ten minutes later, and the mustache was gone. We were done, and you were like, "Boom!" It was over. I was just was like, tired of the way that people treated me with that mustache. <laughs> I, I, I grew it out for the press tour, and I was joking with my friends. But I saw Eddie the Eagle, and I saw me with the mustache. I was like, "I look like Eddie the Eagle. I got to shave this shit." Wait, so you finished filming this in like late 2015? Um, no, fourteen year before, and then we we actually probably could have been out in the fall. We've been we've been done for a while, but this was the the slot. That's good was. slot. Um, I feel like you kind of captured going um, to college in the South. I'm only a year out, um, so you show a bunch of different groups. You show like the goth kids all kind of blending together, honky tonk bars. Can you talk about that sort of experience you had? Because I feel like that's very true to like a very modern experience where all these sort of groups kind of blend together. Yeah, that's, I think that's what it feels like, uh, you know, just to be out, you know, when you're, you, you see all these groups, you know. But I, I think when I was looking back that there really were, was in the culture these kind of very demonstrable different genres and of music and everything, and, and it's really true. We would be at a disco one night, the next night we'd be at a country bar, and we're chasing the drink specials and the girls. You know, no one really was too beholden to the music, but you were just, and then I remember wandering into a punk club, and you know, this was all really happened. And all those were kind of on the table. The music industry was very different than, all that music was really successful, like a, a big, band would sell four or five million albums, you know, and all this was selling. Country was kind of hip then, Urban Cowboy soundtracks. So I just remember all that. And part of that's just being young. Like, you you know, you said you're just out of college. Yeah, you feel that because you're suddenly, the whole point of the movie is all the freedom that hits you when you show up at college. And, And part of that is you now being open to and available. Like, hey, I can go out every night. I Oh, I have new friends and I follow you know them to a club and you know suddenly your life changes and you, you just opened all that so it, it feels that way but when I think chronologically 80 it was you know disco was still around you know it was just kind of an interesting cultural moment things were kind of shifting you know in the 80s soon enough but to me this is kind of the end of the 70s yeah. but that is an eternal eternal thing but I think it's about identity and finding yourself and and just being open to you know to the world more so the question is, why did you choose the music that you chose if, well, if it wasn't? I like to say I have a personal relationship with every song in this movie. You know, I, I remember it all really well. And the, um, the, the disco, there was a disco. It was just kind of a hangout. You know, you would go there. And none of us, I told the guys, because they were getting into it a little too much. I was like, hold down. Hold down. You don't like disco music. <laughs> don't, you know, <laughs> I like it now more than I did then. But, uh, you know, <laughs> you really you're, it. you're more likely to be having a shirt that says disco sucks, you know, because people at like, you know, you go into a Skinner concert or something. It's like even the guy would go disco sucks and the whole audience would go. Rah. But, uh, you know, but you secretly kind of liked it because, you, you know, you could you could dance to it. But I think you had to have a disco. You didn't listen to it. It wasn't. 
some of the songs were hits, you know, so if you listen to the FM dial, the hits, some, you know. But it was kind of dying by this point. It was, it was kind of in its last throes as an economic thing. But um, I don't know. It, I think it ages pretty well. The disco stuff that I, I kind of I, I yeah, like it. Yeah, it does. So, you know, yeah, it hangs, so also you don't it listen to it all the time. But at the time, <laughs> I was like, it was mindless. I mean, you even to say it in the like, we were just at like mindless disco music. That's what it felt. Overproduced, kind of shallow, very repetitious, not about anything. That's what you thought at the day. But you know, like I said, I don't. I, don't, I think a lot of it's aged pretty well. Yeah, I was actually just reading this week an interview with Aaron Sorkin, and he was saying plot is his. When he's writing, because he loves like dialogue driven, character driven. I'm sorry for you. Yeah, plot. I don't think I even have an Achilles. Heel. I don't even. It's not even a biological part of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about plot and versus character based, so um, I don't know. I just don't think that way. You know, I'm trying to really kind of create something that feels like life. You know, like the way we process the world, um, which doesn't have a lot of plot. Describe to me the plot of your life, you know, the twists and the turns. I mean, in retrospect, it looks like that. But I'm really trying to make, create a reality or what seems like a reality that you can buy the way you buy a dream or you buy how you remember things. You don't even remember in plot. You just remember moments and little things and, or big things. But, you know, so I'm trying to get there. And plot really just, it's a human construct. It's not innate to our, our lives so much, but it's, it's, it works so well. It does in storytelling. We kind of crave it. So I'm, I've always been kind of a balance between that. But I think if you override it with strong enough characters, energy, storylines, I mean, there's a lot of story, a lot of characters. So you got to just play to those strengths, you know, but still a good plot twist in the right story. You know, it works great. It always has. Guys, how, how much fun did you have with the ending credits? Oh, come on. They never knew that was going to be in the movie. Yeah. I did that. Oh. They, it was just a side project. You yeah. can talk about the origins of that. Oh. They, yeah, well, yeah. I have like yeah. a 7D and like a little steady cam that we were just like going to fuck around and make like an awesome little thing. And we were going to try to do it in like a Rick one take. Yeah, Q, and, did, Q was doing And Q movie. did like Quentin, yeah. Del Douglas, did the entire soundtrack to that. We all wrote our own raps. And then <laughs> we character. shot it on a lunch break. <laughs> And then Rick actually has an amazing cameo in it that he cut <laughs> out. You can see that on the DVD. Someday. Yeah, Rick. Rick goes nuts. Oh, goes well, nuts. I was just doing what my director told me. <laughs> yeah. and, and, it was the and last he, day of shooting too. Yeah, he loses it. There's it a guy named Stephen Feeder who works for Annapurna <laughs> that oh, kills yeah. it. Love Stephen. <laughs> yeah. And and Rick says, wait, wait, what's, your, "What's your line that you you knocked out of the park?" It was. Uh, it was like, like if you guys, yeah, he goes, he goes, if you creativity. <laughs> Spent as much time working on our movie as you did. Wait, no, much time working on this piece of shit as you did on our movie. This wouldn't be such a fucking piece of shit. The movie, <laughs> we'd be making a good movie instead, instead of this piece, piece of shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was a last day production. I'm you know what? Sure and, and, then he, and then he tosses Stephen Feeder, who's like six five, He's six seven, <laughs> a six He's seven, exactly like you know, ten inches taller than me. Yeah, whatever. And it was it was but brilliant. Exactly. Rick Rick kills it. It's it's probably Rick's finest performance. Uh, outside of Slacker. Outside of Slacker, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little more about Save the Dog. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, it was fun. You only gave me one take, though. That's I all had you better ideas. You actors you always ask for more tapes. That's had, the thing. Yeah. So everybody, everybody wants... I was just finding my... I, I really had better ideas. You got it, bro. You <laughs> killed him first. I didn't need it. I'll always be mixed about it. Okay. Uh, how did the initial script change throughout the course of the shooting? And how much uh, freedom did the actors have to improvise? The script, once you guys showed up, that script, it changed quite a bit. But I will admit, there was an early script that I wrote maybe 10 years ago. It was like a 180-page script that covered like the whole freshman year. My, my ideas, I, I spread it out over the whole year. It was just too unwieldy. This is just my process. That changed a lot. I kind of decided structurally to compress it into this one long weekend, and like that would be the best way to articulate everything I kind of wanted to say and cut out a bunch of stuff that, to me, wasn't as exciting as the relationship. So that was early on. These guys, once they came in, um, I don't know. It's hard to say. It was just a flowing to me. I'm like rewriting there, you know in collaboration with my cast. I do that every movie. So that's me. It's kind of like it's 
it's rehearsal, but it's, it's also just what I think puts us on the track to get a realistic performance. So, and it's a lot of it, like I'm not too beholden to the exact words, like the music's there in a way. I feel like the tone and all that's very dialed in, but the exact words, if, if something funny, a lot of the humor comes out of group dynamics and you'd be crazy not to, to insist like this lame thing I wrote 10 years ago that I see not getting them, it's there, but it's, it's not that funny and it's not, I, I don't see them building on it. Whereas something someone said that kind of takes its place, I mean, that I'd be a bad director if I felt the writer in me was so important. Like screenwriters really, it's, it's not that, the director's job is to make the film work, not be so beholden to a script, even if you wrote it, you know, that it's not a screenwriter's medium. It's, the ideas are important, but your job is to make the film work to an audience. So that's like, you know, I've always lived by that. Please spread the word about Everybody Wants Some. Go to the thank disco. You. Tell Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you to our awesome panel. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.